Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for his guests to share their stories, while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Hey, we'll take a walk with me, not like you used to do, do something differently, put yourself in other people's shoes, open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, typically I say thanks for hitting play. I don't know where that comes from, the idea of hitting play on something. Like, I would love to know the evolution back in the early 80s. That's when I remember hitting play. For those that are curious and want to know. In fact, speaking of things that we played with, my cousin Lisa and I, name dropping now, we would actually, I know this sounds weird, we would borrow my grandmother's boombox. We called her Granny and it was pink. I wish I could find it now. It had a cassette player on it and Lisa would put on Debbie Gibson or Dirty Dancing soundtrack and we would lip sync and dance to it. Yeah, that is a video no one wants to see. I'm sure it was at one point recorded. And then I would then take said cassette tape out and I would put in Michael Jackson and I would typically lip sync to the Man in the Mirror song. Again, video not available or ever been destroyed. But every time I say that, hit play, that's what it invokes in me. I don't know what it invokes in you, but that is what it invokes in me. We're going to take a trip today. I hope you brought your passport. I hope you brought your luggage. It did make it through customs. We are in a different country and I always like to travel, at least in our imagination. One day I'll get over there. One day. But right now we're just going in our imagination. Join with me now, our guest from across the pond, which I'm always wondering where that phrase comes from as well. We won't get too far down that road, maybe. But help me welcome in my new friend, Catherine. Catherine, how are you today? I'm really well and it's great to be here. I really enjoyed your intro where you like segue from one thing to the other. Very entertaining. So yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. When I first started, I would get these manifestos almost. Guests would come on and they're like, okay, you have to read these 87 touch points about what I do or who I am or the 95 books that I've published. And I started realizing I'm not held to anyone else's rules. I'm not answering to anyone else except the guy you're talking to. And and let me tell you, sometimes he can be a tyrant. Sometimes he can be a little bit of a J-E-R-K. Started to realize, you know what? This is my show. I'll make my own monologue and I'll weave in your story into it. And I don't write them. A lot of people think I write them. I don't. I just kind of what I feel in the moment. That's what I love most about getting to do this. It's mine. (laughs) Selfishly said, it's mine. It's my cup. It's my show. And it also reminds me of games we used to play, Mm. uh, you know, with friends or in the family where someone would would say, I remember once doing this game with some friends and and they'd say someone's name. And then you had to come up with someone else's name Mm. where there's some sort of really quirky and interesting connection between those two people that not necessarily everyone in the room knows what that quirky connection is. Like they slept together in the 1970s or he dated her sister or he was in the same band with their brother. And you have to play the game as fast as you can. And it just gets incredibly funny and out there as you as you do this. You suddenly realise you've got all this information in your head and all this imagination and all of these weird connections And it's just really fun. And I think you reminded me of that when you were doing your thing there, because you're like rolling from how one thing kind of triggers another thing. And to me, that's a really, it's a really creative and fun thing to do rather than just always going in straight lines. The shortest distance between two points is not necessarily a straight line. It might be a really curving, spiraling, crazy line and and much more interesting. So yeah, I'm I'm all for that. I can't 
can't believe I dropped Debbie Gibson, though, in the intro. I haven't said that name in a long time. Uh, it was also interesting to me. Again, I don't know what could come out. And that's, I think, what makes people excited to listen, but also kind of cringy, as my 16-year-old would say. Dad, you're very cringy. Oh, well, that's her job at that age. Is that? Okay. Fair enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. They come they come programmed with oh, programmed you know, an app even. that turns on when they hit 13, <laughs> or maybe these days 12. Where they have these, all these things to say. Did you ever watch the Terminator movie? Oh, of course. Yes. I'll be back. Okay. So, you know, like when he arrives and you see what's that sort of window in his head, enemy, friend, kill, kidnap, make friends with, etc. Teenagers come with an equivalent of that, but with all these <laughs> to diss your parents. She's good at that. I'll say something or my wife will say something and it's it's wrong. That was last week. I can't keep up. I don't know how you do it, but I can't, I don't have the I don't have the processing power to try to keep up with the latest trends of of everything. On to you. I love to ask this question, especially of ladies, because it seems to be as the show has gotten older, I do treat my show as a person. I know that seems weird to some. It is a person in some respects to me. I love to ask ladies this. Undoubtedly, I get a really good description, not to put pressure on you by no means. Typically, they will come on and they'll start describing these things that we're going to talk about. And I'm like, wow, I I don't have any point. Again, I don't have any point of reference to that. I, I sometimes feel lost in the woods. So here we are. Here's our question. And that's this we love to lead with is what style of shoe does Catherine love to wear? I like to wear flat shoes or bare feet because I like to feel really relaxed. I like to be able to be really mobile. I like to be able to just start dancing if I want to or running or walking or whatever I want to do. I like flat shoes, slippers, bare feet. And is there like a color scheme or color wise to them? Help us with the description on that if you wouldn't mind. I like green. Green is a great color for me because I have green eyes. Goes with my skin. I'm Celtic by breeding. And so I've got that kind of skin that glows when you wear green. So I love green. I also love like a sort of, over here we call it walnut color. It's like a sort of a tan, but with a, a warmth to it, w warmer than a tan color, like a warm, neutral color. And I also really like kind of creamy ivory color as well. I love those colors in footwear. Well, I just Googled this because I was curious. When you wear green, this is what Google suggests. It's a security thing. It's an abundance. It's love. It's growth. It's luck. For those that believe in luck, it's a balance. So there you go. It also is associated a lot with the forest, with wealth, with olive oil. These are things that green, when people that wear green are associated with. So I was also curious because I undoubtedly, if you meet me in person ever, you probably know this, but I wear light blue almost every day. It is rare to see me not in probably something light blue, whether it be my shoes, my shirt. They have blue, not light blue per se. So we're just going to take that for what it is. But they say blue is authority structure. Also, mm, not sure if that's checking the box. Communication. I feel Definitely. like that might yeah. be a fitting description. Dependability, trust and loyalty. Now, some shades of blue are too much for people which I don't know if that's true or not. It can also project a coldness. When you wear blue, you want to expose or convey power even and mental control. I would love to know this about you as well, Catherine. We're talking about these masks and we're in this series called The Mask. And a lot of people have said, so is this like a playoff of COVID? Is that the mask we're talking about? And I said, well, not necessarily. But one thing about COVID that did, at least here in the States, we covered up our faces. That was the whole point of the mask. Now, I'm not going to get into the science. Should we? Should we have not? I'm not. That's not what I'm here to do. But what I did recognize, even for myself personally, a couple of things. One thing I recognized recognize was I didn't hear as well. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I struggled with hearing people because so many times in conversations, I'm watching their mouth and almost reading their lips. I'm not a great lip reader. I would watch their mouth and then I would try to figure out what they were saying. With the masks, obviously, that was almost impossible. And then I took a position in a retail store where I actively was working with customers on the daily basis. I developed an ear issue, actually almost like an ear infection. It was gross. I don't want to go into the goopy details of it, but it was goopy. Let's just that. leave it at that. <laughs> in that, I actually lost hearing temporarily in one of my ears. So I caught myself leaning 
as I'm trying to stay on the microphone still, leaning towards that person to try to strain to hear what they were saying. And if I didn't have a mask on, by the way, it would have made life a whole lot easier. And so I guess I weave that story to say, has Catherine ever been part of that mask wearing, that idea of maybe hiding behind or concealing maybe something inside of her that others weren't allowed to see and maybe yeah. stopped others from really truly hearing you? If so, speak to that. Well, I'll say something about my response to the mask wearing thing as a way in. Over here, I quickly decided wearing masks was a stupid idea. I didn't want to do it. I grew up in a naturopathic nature cure family. No jabs, no medicines, nothing. The body cures itself. I thought it's not going to work. And also it's going to be very bad for us wearing all these masks. And I did notice a bit like you were saying, interruption of connection with other people through not being able to see the full expression and also not feeling able to express myself. I quickly decided I wasn't going to wear a mask. And so I found a government website page where you could download a special thing that says you've got a mask exemption, which apparently was a legal requirement. They had to provide that, but they didn't tell anybody. They just had to do it legally. So I, I just had this thing that I just never had to wear a mask. And that sort of leads into that my desire is to not be behind a mask. That's my desire and my intention and to not be hiding myself. If ever I have fallen into having a kind of a facade or a, or a mask, it's always been something I've done unconsciously. When I've then found out I'm doing it, I've done my best to drop it. So it's never been something I've aspired to or wanted to do because I've never believed that it would serve me or serve anybody else. When I think about relationships between me and other people, I tend to find that the better we understand each other truly, the easier and more fulfilling the relationship is, even if the thing we find out about each other is not very nice or we don't like it. To me, the whole thing works a lot better than it does if we are behind masks, hiding from each other. Because the trouble is, the minute you're behind a mask, no one's just going to leave it at, that's how they look. The mind doesn't work that way. The mind goes, that's a mask. I'm going to make up what's behind it. I'm going to invent what's behind it. And then I'm going to believe what I've just invented. People don't believe that you are what's represented in the mask. They believe you're what they have invented. It lives behind the mask. And then you've got no idea what they've invented that lives behind your mask. And so you're then just more and more pushed away from each other. So I try to avoid that at all costs, if I possibly can. You talk about they almost invent a narrative, yeah. a facade. I know that's a big thing in these creative spaces that seems like I'm in and maybe you're in as well. This almost imposter syndrome, I think, comes mm. to mind. Is that at all part of your story in any way? When you say imposter syndrome, I understand that to mean where somebody perceives themselves as lying in a way of not really being truthful in that what they're trying to do is a pretense, you know, that they don't really live up to the thing they're trying to be. Is that what you mean by imposter syndrome? Almost like when I was talking about in the beginning with my cousin and I, I'm never going to be Michael Jackson, never. I don't have his skill set in any form or fashion. But I think the idea is you try to pretend or give off a persona or give off an appearance that you're this person. Not that you're mimicking them per se. You're really trying hard to almost appear to seem larger than life. Yes, because you don't feel because you don't feel like you're enough on the inside, yeah. or you don't fit into those shoes, as I might say. Well, you know, shoes actually are a way to do that. I remember when I used to wear ridiculous shoes, high-heeled shoes, possibly bright red, as part and parcel of a whole look, which try to make me seem more interesting, more creative, more confident than I actually was. In my teenage years and early 20s, when I look back at photographs of myself, when I was sort of 15, 16, 17, 18, I look at the photographs and I think, damn, you were quite good looking then. At the time, I didn't think that. I thought I was really boring, dull. I thought I was interesting on the inside. I thought, well, no one can ever see that. What they can see on the outside, I thought it just wasn't interesting not attractive to people. Wear makeup and clothes and all that kind of thing and practice walking a certain way, choosing music I said I liked to kind of join in and fit in, be desirable as a friend or as a girlfriend or whatever it might be. And that was definitely like a mask in that sense. And that was definitely, I don't know if it was as, as, as developed as imposter syndrome, but it was definitely that sense of I'm not enough 
kids can be harsh at that age. Even when people actually did like each other or think the other person was great, they wouldn't tell them. You had to be telepathic to work out what people actually thought about each other because people just didn't know how to communicate. We were, we were very clumsy. We really didn't know what we were doing. And then half of us were doing this thing of just trying to be someone who people want around. And then if I think about later on, I did have times as well when I wanted to be included in with Cool Gang, where I didn't feel like I was as cool as the Cool Gang. And so how do I get included? What are you wearing? Who are you seen out with? To be in the Cool Gang, you've got to drink cocktails, expensive cocktails, right? So you spend far too much money on expensive cocktails as a way of looking like you belong in the Cool Gang. Sporadic bits of memories from, from earlier on in my life around that. It doesn't happen now, really, because I kind of reached a point where I, I'm just not interested in all of that. And I've actually got people in my life who know me as I am, and I know them as, as they are. And I'm happy with that. So I don't feel a need for it now. I'm in a very different place in my life now when all that was the case. Kids are awful. Kids are just <laughs> terrible. Especially growing up, I feel like kids were just mean. And I shared recently with some people that are in my life, you know, I was a terrible kid. I almost want to go back in time, DeLorean of, of Back to the Future, jump inside that, go back to 1989, maybe just jump out real quick and like, hey, little kid, come here, mm, right in the face. <laughs> yeah, I must say I've had that thought. If I could be 14 again, knowing what I know now, none of that behavior would really bother me. That behavior I thought was really terrible then that other people did, it wouldn't bother me now. I'd be like, okay, well, no problem. Call me when you grow up. Then it was everything. I think the idea too behind imposter syndrome is is you almost feel like you're a fraud. You almost feel like you're a phony. Would use the word in the 80s, most likely, or early 90s as a poser. Mm. I remember thinking back to high school and there were a lot of kids that were, they were trying to still figure out who they were they would often portray themselves in this larger than life mentality. In fact, I remember this kid specifically, he lied about everything, lied about just, he had a helicopter. I mean, they were gargantuan lies, had a helicopter. He had a Hummer and he had all this stuff. His dad was in talks with Tom Cruise to do movies with him. And I remember somebody somehow had gotten his address. And I remember us plugging it in, realizing there's no helicopter pad. There's no helicopter. There's nothing. It was not the house he was portraying. You know, not that I throw rocks at folks, but I thought to myself, man, what a life that you had to have all these lies and all these things. And then I found myself feeling no different than him. Because growing up, I felt like my parents were so emotionally disconnected. They were both working a lot. They're wonderful people, by the way, nothing against them. Emotionally speaking, it was hard for them. They both had come from broken homes, broken people, sometimes hurt broken people or make broken people. Finding myself in that trap of telling my dad lies to make me sound more exciting, more, more engaging, or I call them success. That's lies. I actually even put a name to it. And I'm wondering about you. Is there anything that you feel like you've maybe lied to yourself in trying to get yourself to believe? Or is that even part of your story? I think, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think for me, mine is more the, the other side of the coin, which is the one that says I'm not enough in the moments when actually I am enough. I think that's more my particular failing. It's something people often say in my line of work is, you're only as good as your last project. You finish your last project and they're usually very, very involving and absorbing, particularly if you're doing like a big project for, for an organization or something where there's a lot of people involved and then that comes to an end. It finishes, finishes at the right time. It's been successful. And then a few weeks later, you suddenly notice that you no longer believe you're capable of doing anything useful for anybody. You've got some distance from that experience of doing the thing that's, that does require some talent and some skill. And then here you are at home, you know, whether you're doing marketing or whether you're relaxing, whatever it is. And I've definitely experienced that many times, the I'm only as good as my last project. And then a bit time on, I suddenly forget. I suddenly think I'm that, you know, idiot person who with no skills and no experience again. And it's just not true. It's, you know, these self-limiting beliefs that, that we talk about. There's almost this self-limiting belief that I'm not enough. I've got nothing to give. I'm meaningless. It's part of that whole kind of survival armor, I think, that some people create to protect ourselves from, from being disappointed or to protect ourselves from potentially failing. It's not actually helpful. It is not really a helpful thing. I think if, if you're asking me about, did I, was I ever deceptive? I was certainly deceptive to my father when I was a child and 
an adolescent before I left home, I would lie to him all the time because I didn't know I didn't want him to know what I was doing. Because I'd be hitchhiking all over the countryside, hanging out with people, smoking weed, all kinds of stuff, meeting boys, all that sort of stuff that people just want to do. And I would just lie to him about it. And I discovered years later that he knew I was lying, but he just didn't know what to do about it. He was very kind hearted, really kind hearted quite strict in the sense of wanting to really protect us. He just didn't know how to cope with this child who was sort of looking up at him at an angle of 45 degrees, you know, lying through her teeth. And he knew it, but he didn't know what to do about it. He just tried to keep an eye on me. Actually, there was another occasion when it wasn't just me. This was, I got together with a group of people and we were starting a business together. And we'd all met through this enlightenment intensive weekend bit like Landmark Forum. Well, you know, sometimes people go off on a weekend and it's like really, really long days. Oh, and... yeah. So like a Tony Robbins, do you know who that yeah. is? Yeah, 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 yeah. But if yeah, you imagine yeah. you're almost like locked in the hotel room, 17 hours with one pee break, like for four days, it's incredibly intense, really intense. A bunch of us have all done that. And we all decided we wanted to work together afterwards. So we started this business. But of course, we had no business experience. We, hadn't, we did not know what we were doing, but we wanted to get clients. And we decided to start by doing telephone marketing because we thought, right, you just need to be really enthusiastic and communicate in an open way and make people feel got your attention. We were all really good at that because we'd just come off this experience. We were all like wide eyed and shining and in our early twenties and great energy and, that sort of thing. and really annoying actually to our friends. <laughs> Still, we were like that. And so it was like, okay, who's going to go out and get the business? And I happened to have a dark blue skirt suit and some shoes that went with it. And someone else had a briefcase and somebody else had a good watch, which they lent me. So they lent me the briefcase and the watch and I had the suit. And they said, right, okay, you're the sales. I had to go out to these potential clients and tell them we are the best telephone marketing agency in the UK, possibly the whole of Europe. We'd done nothing. We'd had no clients (laughs) and I had to convince them. Oh, and not only that, we need you to pay up front to demonstrate your commitment. The real reason was because we needed them to pay up front because we had no money to pay ourselves or pay the rent. That was definitely a deception in order to get the business. We did actually, to be fair, we did become the best telephone marketing agency in the UK over time. It wasn't true at the beginning. Stand up straight, shoulders back, take a deep breath, walk in, look them in the eye. That was, a, that was quite an experience. That's what prompted me to go down this road is I think for so many years and, and for so many folks even, they haven't been able to really define who they are. Their achievements doesn't define them. I would imagine it's true here in the States and probably even true over there is this need to be seen, this need to be accepted. I mean, I remember at 18, the first time I ever got a credit card from Wells Fargo, I'll name drop. I, by the way, the interest, I I do remember this, the interest was 23%, by the way, 23%. And I remember being so excited, seeing my name in, in print and seeing my name with a dollar amount associated with how much they were gonna give me based on my name. Now, mind you, I was 18, so I'm sure they sold my name and probably everyone and their grandma had my name and information. But I didn't know that. I thought I was special because Wells Fargo was going to give me all this money just based on my name. Has that been part of the story of Catherine as well? Is this need and this want and this desire to be seen, to really be heard even? Yes, I, I definitely have this strong desire to be to be seen, to be heard, and to be known. One of my teachers, a chap called John Heron, a brilliant man, he said that the six emotional needs that we all have, and they are to love and to be loved, to understand and to be understood, and to choose and to be chosen. I think what you're talking about is the being understood and the being chosen as as who you are. And I've I've always, always wanted all of those things. It wasn't until, until I saw John Heron's model that I've just verbalized there that I was able to kind of make sense of it. Perfect, perfect sense. I need all of those things. I need to understand what the hell is going on. I also need to feel understood, actually understood. And I, and I think there's a distinction between wanting to feel like we're accepted putting on an act in order to be accepted, which means 
we're not then really accepted as who we are, that the act is the thing that's accepted, but we still don't really feel accepted because it's not the real us that is being accepted. But in order to be really accepted as who we are, we need to be visible as who we are. We need to let people see us as we actually are. And that can be a challenge and that can be scary. And there's this whole notion of you know, who do we feel safe with to fully be vulnerable with and fully be open with? I'm involved with somebody at the moment who's an amazing, amazing human being. Every single time I share some piece of myself that I think might be really off-putting for him, every single time he's completely cool with it. Every single time I'm about to do that, I have the thought again, okay, maybe this will be the one that finally is too much for him. (laughs) Maybe this will be the one that will be really... And it's not like I've got this list of things that I'm sort of paying out one by one. Something occurs to me or I hit an experience or I have a meltdown or whatever it is that's going on with me. And it's always an unplanned thing. But then there's always this question of, to what extent can I share this with somebody else? Is it reasonable to do that? To what extent would it be wrong to share it with somebody else? Because they don't need this nonsense in their life. Or to what extent do I need to share it? They deserve the whole me as I fully am. And then they choose if they still want to be around me. I think that whole question is a lifelong thing. I, years ago, I used to think, OK, maybe I'll get to a point. Who is it? The Scientologists, I think it is, who say you can reach a point where, where you are clear, which means that you've got rid of all your baggage. There's no self-limiting beliefs left at all. There's no psychological neuroses left. You're absolutely clear and pure forever. And I used to think, hey, that's a fantastic idea. How do I get there? How do I get to that point? But I've now discovered that does not exist in this lifetime. It might exist after death. Who knows? It does not exist in a human lifetime. There's an endless supply of things we might be worried about letting other people see in us. Endless. And equally, we have an endless capacity for loving and accepting other people as well. So it's very much a moving feast, I I think. It's not like a black and white. Did you carry around a stuffed animal as a child? I don't think I did. So for years... When I was a child, I mean years, multiple, maybe even 10-ish years, I carried around a stuffed animal panda bear. Everywhere I went, panda went. If I went into the hospital, panda went with me. If I got one of the ID bracelets, panda also had to get one too in case he got lost. I have a vivid memory of taking him to show and tell. We had a box, but I remember riding the bus from kindergarten back to the daycare center where my mom worked at and the teacher had given me the box to put whatever your show and tell item had to fit in the box. So anyway, I remember riding the bus back to kindergarten, checking the box, like to make sure he was okay in there. I remember vividly doing that. You okay? Okay. Can you breathe? Okay. And having conversations with this panda bear. And then years later, when I discovered Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin, I think it just enveloped even more like, well, he does it. It's okay. Christopher Robin talks to Winnie the Pooh. I'm not crazy because he's talking to a bear and I'm talking to a bear. I bring all that about because recently I've been going through counseling. And in that, I was trying to discover with my counselor why on earth a young boy had this bear and had had it had to have it with him everywhere I went. I'd forgotten about him for a long time. My daughter comes along. I actually had, had seen him in a box and then... We got my daughter a bunch of stuffed animals and she's collected them through the years. They have these pet nets, hold all the stuffed animals up in the air. Oh, yeah. Went into a room one day and I thought, oh, my gosh, Panda's in here. He doesn't belong in here. This is not where he goes. And so I, I actually brought him into the room that I'm in now. I say all that because I was trying to figure out and trying to unlock or trying to discover whatever you want to say there. Why on earth I needed this bear around me? Why I needed this support around me? And he interestingly tells me, for whatever reason, you didn't feel safe around the people around you. So in your imagination, the bear became the place where you went for safety. You told the bear that the bear kept secrets. You protected the bear. I was like, all that? (laughs) I don't know if I believe it. I do feel safer when I'm around Panda, even now as an adult. I know that sounds weird to say to some. Is there an attachment challenge that you run into as well? The first thing I want to say is that I probably don't have the same attitude to things like having a stuffed animal like you're describing as perhaps your therapist did. A different point of view. I would love to hear it. I think it's completely cool. You had a bear. Fantastic. That is a piece of your creativity and a piece of your relating with something, part of what you were doing. You know, I don't see it as a negative or a, a 
a sign of something that's wrong with you or something that's missing. I just don't think that way. I think we're very complex as humans and we utilize what's in our lives in different ways to support us. So, so I'm a little bit different around that. I'm also not into this thing where the therapist tells the person what the thing means. I'm just really not into that. I decided years ago not to go the psychotherapist route as in training as a psychotherapist and having all of that mainstream programming put into me about how you deal with human experience. I went the alternative route instead. So I have a very, very different take on those things. When it comes to attachment, I would say that my most unhelpful attachments in my life have been to actual other human beings, not things. I've become attached to people either because that person genuinely is a very nurturing element in my life. I've kind of become dependent on it. I haven't managed to sort of incorporate it into my own self-maintaining process and therefore I've become a kind of attached to that person, almost like what I would to a parent or a, a teacher who treats you particularly well. And the other times when I've become attached to other people have been when it's been completely the opposite, where it's somebody who treats me badly, doesn't show up for me in in the way I would love them to. And then something in me becomes more desperate to get them to do that. And that's a really unhealthy attachment. Those are two things I've experienced in my life. They're really connected to those emotional needs I spoke about before, finding myself in situations where I've kind of stopped being really conscious about the truth of the real situation, where I've sort of unconsciously started to kid myself about the situation, then got myself trapped in something that doesn't work. I've experienced those on multiple occasions throughout my life. And I've always had to sort of extricate myself from them, but not to things so much. I get very, very identified with my car, particularly if it's a car I particularly love, like a really beautiful car, and then it gets damaged or somebody backs into it or somebody steals the badge off the front. One of my cars, I came out in the morning and then someone had stolen the badge off the front of the car. I felt like they had cut my hand off or something. I felt I'd been abused. And my brother saying to me, Catherine, it's a car. Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, you should look after it. Yes, we call it she. It's it's a car. And you have to kind of let go of that. I'm the same with my home. I'm very identified with my home. My home really matters to me. If someone comes and bangs on the door with a really kind of hostile energy, I feel really, really intruded on. I feel really, I really, really don't like it at all. I'm conscious of these attachments. I'm sure I've got attachments I'm not conscious of, but I can't tell you about those because I'm not conscious of them right now. I'll probably think about them later. What's Catherine's why? Why does Catherine get up? Why does Catherine want to do what she does? Why is it such a motivator for you to keep moving forward? Okay, so I've I've always been really I've always had this wonder of being alive, you know, just the oh my god, I'm I'm even alive. To me, that's always been a good enough reason to just keep being curious and and expanding and growing. I've just always naturally been like that. And I was very much encouraged that way by my parents, who were very, very unusual parents in the sense of in- encouraging us to think for ourselves. And I also really noticed that there were a lot of adults around who seemed to be lying to themselves and to other people. I noticed this when I was six years old. I proceeded to be a really annoying child because I kept challenging people on this And my teachers hated it. They couldn't understand why I didn't want to just fit in, just kind of comply with everything. And I just didn't. So I think I was naturally like that, but also encouraged in that by my parents. As I've got older, I've learned more about human beings in general, society and culture. I've come to the conclusion that the next most important thing for our evolution for humanity is the raising of our level of consciousness. So I, my whole commitment and reasoning behind all the work I do is to help people raise their level of consciousness for that to manifest in their lives in whatever way it it will. Because I believe that's the best contribution to humanity that I could possibly make, which is to continuously be seeking to raise my own level of consciousness and helping other people to do that as well. So I do a lot of things in my life with that in mind, which I also really love doing. I really enjoy. It's also very fulfilling to me with my when I'm working with clients, it's it's exactly the same thing. So that's what really keeps me moving forward. When my consciousness shifts around anything, everything else seems to shift. I sometimes talk a bit that the con- consciousness is like the big on switch in us. When we become more clear and aware and conscious in our lives, everything else can 
can shift, even down to our physicalness, our digestion, our sleep, our enthusiasm, our creativity, our empathy, our communication, everything shifts when our consciousness shifts. The benefits and positive outcomes from that are very quick because I've been practicing this for for a very, very long time. The shifts that can occur are very quick. Let's say I'm getting into a snarl in my head about something and concerned about it and it's a real problem and I can't work it out. If I undergo a shift in consciousness by doing one of the practices that I do, suddenly the problem looks completely different. Suddenly the way through is clear. Suddenly everything's different. Different before I've even done anything about it. And I've seen that with clients as well, where they come to me and they're talking about all sorts of things, issues, things they want to achieve, etc. They undergo a shift in consciousness. And the next thing I get is, Catherine, I'm not sure if there's a connection between our last conversation and what's just happened. However, and they tell me this thing that they've just done, that they would never have done a week beforehand or a month beforehand. Inside themselves, they, they've had a shift. It's almost magical, the result of that. When I'm speaking in this way, some people would hear this and say, well, well, that sounds like complete nonsense. I also believe that most people have had this experience at least once in their lives, if not frequently. Something shifts that you don't necessarily understand what the shift is, but suddenly the path is clearer, the way ahead is easier, the ride is more enjoyable, the ride of life is more enjoyable and more fulfilling. So that's what's behind pretty much everything I'm doing. So how did you come about learning this? Do you think it was a a learned skill of helping folks walk through this shifting of life? Or do you think it was bestowed upon you for maybe a higher power or higher purpose? Anything that is accomplished when I'm working with clients is definitely not me accomplishing it. It's a combination of the client, what I think of as the universal cosmic light, truth, the source whatever you want to call it. It's not actually me. I'm a, I'm a facilitator. My wisdom and my skill are not great enough to accomplish the outcomes. The potential that anyone has, someone who wants to work with me, the potential they have already, and then that connected with the, the source energy, whatever you want to call it, that's what gets the results. So I have a great deal of humility around that. And that's very helpful for me, but it's helpful for the clients. That said, I've done a lot of training on myself, starting from, I would actually say, even in my childhood, you know, my parents would have me spend time with these extraordinary thought leaders when I was a child still, doing these extraordinary kind of processes around personal responsibility, creativity, play, curiosity, asking questions, thinking for myself. So all of that started when I was very young, probably when I was six, seven, eight years old. And so that was right in my background. And then I went off and did this enlightenment series of seminars. I did a lot of work around conscious body work, conscious movement, conscious dance, and around how people can use that to really unlock themselves free themselves. I did a lot of training around humanistic psychology, helping people with their psychology, (laughs) the, the way they think, their emotionality, all of that. I've done an awful lot of training in energy work, which is around the human energy field, the universal energy field, cosmic consciousness, all all that things. I've I've done an awful lot of training and work, which has really fed me, means I'm a much happier and more fulfilled person than I otherwise would be. But also I've trained in all those things so I can also work with other people. So I bring to bear whatever kind of techniques or processes seem to be appropriate. And people choose to come to me through whichever avenue they find most appealing to kind of connect in with me. The idea that somebody can get to a place or a spot, the conscious experience to say, okay, I I don't need to be that person anymore. I don't need to, again, maybe it's wear the mask any longer. So you're helping kind of folks walk through that demasking. Maybe you wouldn't use this type of verbiage, that kind of demasking and kind of stripping down and getting back down to the real root of what they're about. A way of describing what that can feel like for somebody and certainly how it feels like for me. It's almost like if you think of the mask, that the mask is made of paper, let's say. So what you can do is you can tear away the paper and then there will always be another mask behind it, another mask, but you can keep going and tear away the paper. And that can be quite an exposing and painful experience. An alternative way of doing it is to act 
access the spirit within the person and give that spirit the attention and the nourishment. And metaphorically, this spirit starts to feel like it's expanding and it's glowing, shining with light, if you like. And that glowing and shining with light of the spirit melts the masks away from within. So the masks just drop away in the face of this beautiful warmth and light coming out from inside. That's a very enjoyable experience. That's not a painful experience. Coming from the inside out rather than working from the outside in. It's not about shining lights and glows and all that sort of thing. That's just a a kind of a metaphor for describing that experience. It sounds like fascinating work, but also very, it seems to be very taxing as well, I would imagine. It's really enjoyable really enjoyable to do and very fulfilling to do. And it does take take energy. I need to make sure I have plenty of rest, eat well, get plenty of hugs. I need to take care of myself in order to do it. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. But you see, for me, it's less work than it would be to be doing something I don't believe in. That would be more work. I've got a friend who works in the city and she's very well paid. She's very senior in her company. She travels to the States. She's very well liked, etc. And I look at what she's doing and I think I'd rather shoot myself in the face. I say to her, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I love it. I'm really enjoying it. And she looks what I'm doing and thinks, whoa, I would hate to do that. But to me, I love it. I think that's the joy of life is once you find that thing that you really love and that allows you to come alive, you really never work again the rest yeah. of your life. I mean, that's, I think that's what everyone wants. I mean, I know that's what I want. It's what a lot of folks tell me when I talk to them. Not everyone wants to do what everyone else wants to do. You believe in this division of labor thing where if you want to create something or build a business or have a project or grow yourself or whatever it is you want to do, sometimes you'll do that by yourself. And sometimes you'll do that with a friend. And sometimes you'll hire some professional assistance with it. Use the resources that are there for you. And I use a lot of resources to support me as well. And I have people I can phone up and talk to and I go to other people to support me in in what I am doing. We all help each other in the ways that we can. Well, I think that's what's so great about having a community around you. I believe truly that everyone needs someone. You do need that kind of cheerleader person or that person behind you that is going to continue to spur you on to better and greater things. I think most of us do need that. There's a the very rare person who doesn't, but those are very rare people. You know, I think most people do need that. I, I certainly really value that. Well, Catherine, as we wind down, how can folks get in touch with you? What's the best way that they can connect and continue this conversation with you if they desire that? Thank you. Well, I would love people to do that. And I would suggest that they actually tune into my podcast, which is called Truth and Transcendence. The idea is that when we can find and connect with our truth, then we can transcend, which is some of what I've been talking about. So if people listen to that, they're going to get some great, great, content on there. Very enlightening, very encouraging and uplifting stuff on there. If after listening to a few episodes, people think, actually, I would actually like to talk to Catherine myself. All of the contact details are in the show notes of every episode. So that's the way in that I really recommend for people. And thank you for the opportunity. What do you love most about podcasting? The variety of experience and the variety of learning. Every guest who comes on, I I learn something completely different. Their perspective on life is always unique. And I find that just fascinating. And it's almost like I get a free consultation every week from some incredible human being that just adds so much to me. And the other thing I really love is the fact that it keeps me really alive and on my toes. I can't cruise as a podcaster. I can't just go into a rut and do it the same way every time. I would not be able to get away with it. So I have to be right there present every single time. And that's very good for me. Well, and to date, you're almost at 100 episodes. Yeah, I think I've aired 96 six or seven. And I've actually recorded 102. Wow. There we go. And I'm recording another one this afternoon. I'm a big fan of your episode 96. Just uh, just saying, I'm a big fan of, of that particular guest, only because we had the opportunity to walk in Dr. Danny. We had him on The Reading Guy. You guys might remember him from a while back. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Very insightful yeah. gentleman. Just really enjoyed him. In fact, I took his show notes. A friend of mine actually said, what's with your show notes? I wrote them all backwards. I found a program that actually transcribed them all backwards. 
<laughs> and so I said, we called the episode, I can't read because he's all about reading and getting kids to read. Uh, I clever. just thought that was very insightful. Lovely guy. Yeah, liked him a lot. So yeah, go check it out, guys. She is on most podcast platforms. I would imagine where you hear us, you can most likely hear her as well. So good times there. Well, Catherine, before we let you go, it's only fitting that we do some silliness together now. I've heard you're kind of a silly gal. That's what they're telling me from across the pond. There's a lot of laughter that is cascading all the way from the Atlantic all the way to the West Coast here in Oregon. Okay. Uh, Oregon. Maybe I'm making stuff up right now. I could be, but we do the silly thing at the end of our show. Now, help me with this. Has Michael Jordan and his legacy made it all the way to England? I don't know anything about sports. He's a sportsman, right? Yeah, he played for the Chicago Bulls back in the day. And then in 92, they were in Barcelona at the Dream Team. That's what they called them in Barcelona, right. Spain. So I don't know where you were in 92 in that time frame. Hopefully, maybe near Spain, because that would have been the place to be. I have no connection with sports at all. I'm hopeless. <laughs> I'm sorry. Next to me, everyone else can feel really, really clever about sport. If your eternity rested on your sports knowledge, you would be in trouble is what I'm saying. In serious trouble. Well, there is this university here. I think they call those even in Great Britain universities when you go on to higher education, right? We do university. have those. Yes, we do. Well, there's this amazing university called the University of North Carolina, which is my favorite school, my favorite university. It's in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm a little bit mildly sort of obsessed with the school. I never went to school there, but I do enjoy the color and I love what the school stands for. And so back to that, Michael Jordan went to is school your, there, Is so. your light blue color? The, 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 the... That's where it all comes from. Yeah, uh -huh. I s sort of borrowed from them to make it my own. It's a good color for you, by the way. Thank you. I, I like it. Every time I wear it, I get excited. Yeah. So we do this thing at the end of the show. It's called Senseless. It's these silly questions at the end of the show just to kind of have some fun to, to end with. So I'm going to roll because you didn't bring a... Well, I mean, you brought a cup, but you didn't bring a cup with a die, which is fine. You didn't know. It's fine. Anyway, one of these times I should have a guest bring their own die. Maybe I should require that. So you got this one, number two, even the two is yeah. light blue. How fun is that? It's pale blue, yeah. Yep, pale blue or light blue, sky and the blue. Wall, the wall is pale blue behind you as well. Yes, and the cup I was drinking out of. Are you sensing a pattern here? I'm really, really getting a, like a like a, a congruency. You're obviously totally in alignment with yourself. My headphone cord, also pale light blue. blue. My mic cord, also light blue. Number two, is this for you? This is an exciting one. I really like this question. Whoever wrote it, great job writing it. We have great writers here, great writers here. I sound like Donald Trump sometimes when yes. I do that. Former President Donald Trump. Two things you hope to finish this year. I want to finish this new website. I've just start, started working on launching the new branding, but I want to do that by the end of the summer, not, not just this year. Also, I have a car which I want to sell by the end of this year. And it's not as easy as it might sound. There's many complications in the history and the story of this particular car, but I want to get that sold. And also by the end of this year, I want to convert the barn. I think that was more than two, but we're going to allow it. It's fine. She's got a lot to do, folks. But if you don't have a lot to do today, or maybe you do have a lot to do and you need some motivation and you need some different voices on a perhaps different perspective on life, definitely give my friend Catherine a good listen. Catherine, thanks for giving us some moments today. Really appreciate your time and efforts that you gave to us. I really love that. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, what do we do with that? I love going across the pond. I love the accent. No one else? Am I alone in that? Come on. Tell me you're not excited when you hear that accent. And so it's always fun for me. I always feel so astute. I felt like I needed some tea today. So what are you walking away with? Teacup in hand. What did you hear? What did you experience? Can you really transcend beyond the mask? Ooh, what a great name. Transcend beyond the mask. Now listen, when I hear it say the word transcend, what, what does that invoke in you? I know a lot of questions, a lot of why right now. Why are you still there? One might even ask. So with all that said, I just want to remind you of this before we get out of here. And that's this. Do not ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.